Um, can I have a clicker thing? Oh, man. <laughs> I just don't know why you all need these technological things. This is going to be exciting, because I'm very old and confused by buttons. Um, I'm hoping most of you are young enough to not know who the hell I am. Uh, but I was mentioned in an earlier speech where apparently I hate Edge. Uh, so, callback, apparently. I'm Kieran Gillen, and I am from the past. I'm from the 90s. I'm from the 80s. I'm even a little bit of the 70s. My first memories of video game culture were the first memories of video game culture. I mean, obviously Space Invaders, I mean, Pong was before, but Pong is Pong and a mono thing rather than a wider statement. And you have the microcultures around Space War, but that bears as much relation to game culture as, say, experimental anarchist communes did to the Russian Revolution. You get the point. Um, I'll tell you what the 80s were like in Britain. The 80s were... It was very lonely. Uh, the history of video games, you learned, is entirely unconnected to the life as lived there. In 1985, you would not have cared about Super Mario Brothers because it wasn't released in here until 1987. You would not have cared about it in 1987 because no one cared about the NES in the UK, ever. <laughs> the, even the Sega Master System was more an impact. It sold nothing, and in fact, because there was a pre-existing uh, eco-culture of games. Uh, but it really wasn't significantly better then. One of, the be one of the better parts of researching this speech was digging out the original Mario reviews in the UK, and it was kind of like, well, some of them are pretty goodish. But there was like the lukewarm one, and oh, it's far too expensive, that kind of stuff. And it's really nice to see a game which is a sacred cow treated like a, just another game, which of course it is. If you're being really honest in the UK, it only really became, Nintendo really became important circa the snares, and that was really much more about um, the Super uh, Street Fighter conversion rather than anything like fucking Zelda. I literally never saw a NES outside a shop for my entire life as a child. This is not unusual. You may think otherwise. This is because you have been fed lies. <laughs> um, the narrative of the great gaming crash, Nintendo saved a form. That's true, it's, it's, all, it's only an American narrative. And as much as Americans like to think so, it's not all about them. Um, in the 80s, British gaming was fine, or more likely its own thing. In evolutionary terms, we are like Australia. I just realised I had another slide here, which is just vaguely because I need another slide. We are like Australia. Fundamentally, Think of an, an ecosystem that's grown its own life forms. Think of British gaming in the period like a marsupial. You know, you just kind of see what it does, but it's also quite unfamiliar to the rest of the world's uh, evolution. I did a degree in that and I forgot all the words. Uh, anyway, of course you could do this story, frankly, about any country. The you could, French and Germany both had a really interesting period they can explore. Frankly, that the general history of Soviet bloc gaming comes down to Tetris. Uh, it's kind of shameful, uh, but I haven't got time to do that and I'm very lazy. <laughs> anyway, when the history books were written in the 90s, there was a duopoly of American Japanese corporate interests shaping that narrative. And basically, what I am saying in this speech is what I've been saying for the last 15 years, sorry, the 15 years I spent as a games critic. <laughs> uh, so what was the British gaming scene really like and why on earth do I think it's worth talking about to a room full of people in 2015? This is an interesting history of the British game scene, as written by my good friend Magnus Anderson. It's called that name. With apologies to Magnus, I'm going to try to paraphrase his position. Fundamentally, government investment uh, in the early 80s led to a blossoming of computer literacy, fed through projects like the BBC in schools. This led to a culture of a technical brilliance etc etc leading to elite which was this enormous technical achievement basically fitting eight galaxies into 64k i wrote this open office obviously the open office dock was bigger than 64k in and of itself uh, this leads in a very long roundabout route of technical excellence towards gta uh, 3 uh, and there's an implied route between elite and gta 3 as a true stories um, if you know british development uh, you will likely know a, a variation of that particular story it is the history of British development as told by the posh kids. This is because the BBC is what the posh kids owned. It's telling when Edge did their retro reviews in 2002. Uh, they reviewed a load of old games and it's pretending that Edge existed then. They gave two tens. Both the tens were to Elite and Exile. Two BBC games and Tony Blood thereof. Posh kids, fuck them. Fuck Edge. <laughs> uh, this is fundamentally against the core of what was most striking about British game development. It does not take away from what they achieved. Uh, we're given the incredible scarcity of the resources at the time. Uh, necessity bred some incredibly brilliant developers. What's more interesting, though, is what opportunity gifted them. Uh, especially a common argument in the last decade is that the rising um, 
See what the next slide is? Oh, it's Elite. Uh, <laughs> the sliding... <laughs> Has anyone actually heard the Elite song? Uh, go Google Elite the Musical and the I Am Elite is amazing. Listen to the end, there's a full set of bit, it'll kill you. Um, the argument is, you know, uh, more commonly available and more accessible game tools leads games development to be open to much wider demographics of people, therefore leading to a much more diverse form of games. I would agree with that argument entirely, uh, and it's a great thing. Um, it's fundamentally what you do when you get some, you know, culturally educated people making games. Fantastic. It's astounding. I've loved it. Uh, as far as I think there's a precedent to it, it's the British game scene in the 80s. In Britain, computers were dirt cheap. Oh, sorry, home computers were relatively dirt cheap. Uh, as such, any, if you were playing a game, because no one had a console, you are playing on a keyboard. As such, everyone had access to means of production, therefore significantly less prosperous demographics got it. If I lived in America, I could have never owned a PC. My family are quite, like, very working class. Uh, <coughs> if we had one, we'd own an NES. We've got to play. But only, we've got to play, yes, but only to consume. In the UK, I got my hands dirty. In fact, I had to get my hands dirty to even load a game. Not everyone took the chance that was before them, obviously, but more people had the chance, and that led to much of the character of the games. By way of example, and I'd entirely forgotten I did this until I did the speech, um, in 1986, where I was 11, I made a game called Advanced Jump Off a Cliff Simulator. Uh, it was clearly a, a suicide simulator, weirdly, for an 11-year-old, I stress. You know, and if that came out in 2008, I would have probably put that on Opa Yes. Uh, so I used to write, work for Opa Paper Shotgun. But no, it was me as 11 year old programmed this really quite disturbing art game. <laughs> um, what's interesting about the British game scene, for me at the time, the isn't the heroic efforts the programmers had to do to achieve anything, but more precisely what brand of impossible they chose to achieve. In short, this is about engaging with culture. This is, what, if, uh, for me, a forefront of the British game scene in a way that isn't, isn't really true in the period duopoly of Japanese and American development. If in the UK you weren't playing Jets at Willy, sorry, if you were in the UK and you were not playing Jets at Willy, you were probably playing Monty Mole instead of Mario. Um, Monty Mole uh, was basically about the miner strike. He was collecting coal to gather his family. This is fundamentally what it is. Um, you may think this is a footnote. It's not. Uh, this is absolutely what people did with games. Uh, here's a thought experiment for you. Imagine if Miyamoto actually had something to say. <laughs> Imagine if Miyamoto had something to say and his publisher would let him. There's absolutely no reason Mario could not be in about the... Okay, not the minor strike, but it could have been about something. <laughs> I mean, it's not really about the, the problems of like, New York plumbers, is it? Um, I'm gonna basically going to spin out two threads from here, uh, which are kind of key for at least what I think translates, interestingly, to the modern times. There's actually a third strand which kind of synthesises what Magnus argued, which is basically the technical excellence argument and uh, my side which is basically about transgression and art and culture uh, and that's basically the, what led to the open world stuff but we, British government kind of gets credit for that maybe not enough credit but certainly some so I'm only going to come back to that at the end one of these strands over here I will roughly phrase as the birth of cool the over here is basically early examples of games as expression um, what's this one? Hey. If you, were new, if you actually read most histories of games, the word cool probably turns up in 94, 95, the early PlayStation. Um, it talks about stuff like, you know, Rizzlers with Sony branded Rizzlers being sold at Glastonbury and that kind of thing in 95, which is true, I was there. Um, but I, I always remember the first time I was in a CD basement club and this enormous record was dropping and I was throwing all manners of embarrassing shapes. I couldn't quite place it. And then I went, oh, chemical beats and wipeout. Of course. <laughs> now, you know, that was novel. I never actually experienced that in a club before. But I was there, certainly experienced where it was from. Wipeout was an unprecedented thing. Wipeout was a Cygnosis game. Their initial reputation in the 80s was, came from the aesthetic choices. These Roger Dean covers, the opulence, the kind of music videos. They made game, they game boxes that looked like you were meant to do coke lines off them. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And the idea that this is part of the, the vocabulary, I guess, that this is allowed. Cygnosis and those sort of innovations were consumed alive by Sony. They are gone. Sony gets the credit. History is written by the winners. Um, there weren't even a particularly extreme example um, of example of developers being a bit pop literate. Let's talk about the Bitmap Brothers, who were the first people who realised that wearing shades in a photo shoot was a really good way to annoy a lot of the right sorts of people. <laughs> the Bitmap Brothers are relevant specifically for what they did around 1990, but they kind of hit upon this idea a little earlier in a game called Xenon 2 Mega Blast. Hell of a title. Um, let's have a look at this, the cover for Xenon 2 Mega Blast. <laughs> 
Now this could not be more 1989 if it was standing in a speaker in a Manchester illegal club screaming Acid. <laughs> uh, it had a bomb the bass soundtrack. Uh, this is kind of what spelled out into what Bitmaps did. When they formed the, the publisher Renegade, they struck deals with Rhythm King, which led to basically all their stuff having music, uh, all this popular music of, of a relatively interesting sort. Magic Pockets wasn't exactly the game we hoped for, but it was a game that featured Betty Boo, and that has a certain quality I love. I'll throw this in here, because it's a kind of a side point and very much much more my own personal piece of nonsense. Uh, in America, the games press grew from the technical press. In Britain, the games press uh, grew from, stylistically anyway, from the music press. Uh, you, your, your Sinclair's great innovation of the period was to rip off smash hits and do it about games, and it was brilliant. If it was a longer speech, I'll segue into Sensible Software, who kind of did similar things to the bitmaps, but perhaps with a little bit more indie culture approach. Uh, I'll mention Wizkid in passing, but Wizkid is a game which, if you play now, you would find it interesting to contextualise. Um, Sony, uh, Sony's primary victory of the PlayStation, for my money, was using this culture of culture, throwing a shitload of money at it, and then bringing it to a console audience. Um, and that, for me at least, is a fundamental British line that explored there before. You don't see much of that in any other country's development except possibly France. Um, anyway, before they moved on, the bitmaps did a game called uh, Chaos Engine. This kind of segues to my next point, um, where, and it's basically a steampunk game. Did it in 93. The only real interesting thing, and of course I really like Chaos Engine, is that it was 93 and the difference engine, kind of the official birth of steampunk, was in 1990. So in other words, this was relatively hot shit. I don't think anyone had, had anyone really riff on steampunk before then. The idea that games could take something that is actually relatively novel and do one of the first things is exciting. That's a lot of the stuff from the British in the period they did. The idea of actually adaptation in a way which was a little bit more than a standard four-year movie license. This makes me think about Laws of Midnight, uh, which is beautiful in every single possible way. Uh, Laws of Midnight is the departed Mike Singleton's masterpiece. Um, masterpiece is a very overused word. Um, it's, it's most often referenced as part of that chain from the line from Elite to um, GTA 3. And it's sort of their midwinter, midwinter, which is another one of Mike's games, happened afterwards. Um, it's usually talked about as this... Actually, I'm lying. Um, that comparison is normally what Edge would make, I say. And I sort of realised I've never actually seen Edge do it, but I've definitely seen Simon Parkin do it. And that's, you know, and Simon Parkin was always proof you can take a boy out of Edge, but you can't, you can't take Edge out of the boy. <laughs> He released, that book, he released a book this year, Death by Video Games. It's utterly astounding. Everyone should buy it. I digress. Lord of Midnight <laughs> is interesting in what it's achieved. It really is one of those technical things people talk about. 80 million sprites and views and this entire world and all that kind of stuff. Marvellous. What's really interesting is what it chose to achieve. Lord of Midnight is, and this may sound really like faint praise, but I don't mean it so, it's by far the greatest Lord of the Rings based game I've, has ever been made on any format ever. <laughs> it's really hard to explain. Lord, uh, Lords of Midnight basically works of you controlling a small group of people in a turn-based first-person world, which is, which is also phase-based, so you kind of alternate between day and night cycles. And the whole game is based on this enormous sort of mythic reading of game mechanics. So you can go and take the definitely not ring, one ring, to the definitely not Mordor to destroy it. And you can, or you can fight this enormous land war against this literally impossible force. Every single mechanic is turned towards trying to basically create that, that, that core Lord of the Ringsness. Um, to quote a student, for, uh, to quote a student of a teacher, uh, of a friend of Rab Florence, uh, who's great. He, uh, Lord of the Midnight is a little like playing a poem. And what he's referring to there is the fact you get these weirdly evocative statements above all the screenshots. You'll see them as I flick through them. Um, and we all talk about the views of the game. Like This is an example of the view. And that's in the text. And this, this is like, there's so many views in the game, and this is an enormous graphical achievement. What people don't really talk about is what it really means. Um, you know, fundamentally, it's a game that designed itself look like Lord of the Rings and trying to evoke those feelings. This is an adaptation. Of course, this, I'm not talking Proust here. Uh, this is an adaptation of Lord of the Rings. This is about as core geek mainstream as we can get. But the fundamental point is that whilst everyone says they love Lord of the Rings, there's fuck all sign of it in any of the games, ever. <laughs> there's a reason why. Uh, in Lord's Midnight, there's not a single atom of Dungeons and Dragons. There's barely any of it um, in any of the actual period fantasy games of the time. And I really liked Bard's Tale, the original one, when it came out. That was a completely different thing and very much American derived. 
if I was um, talking about other games, I'd be saying things like Heavy on the Magic and Tyrannog Nog and other ones you'll not have heard of. Okay, why? Because D&D was not a cultural influence in Britain in the 80s. It just wasn't there as a mechanical structure. Uh, therefore, the developers weren't being influenced by it. It was there, but not as a core influence. As a shorthand, American developers were trying to actually work out a way to play D&D on the computer. Uh, British developers were working out a way to make fantasy work on the computer. These are completely different tasks. One is about translating mechanics from one game to another and copying them, and the other one is about art. Uh, to choose another random example from the period, uh, look at Alien. The conversion of Alien uh, was very clever. It was, in, it was a, all set in a very small environment, uh, and you had like all the cast are there and one person Alien. So it's basically replaying the film. The big change was it replayed the situation rather than the actual film. You had no idea who had the alien inside them. So in other words, you know what I mean? That was, that's an understanding of Alien. This is what's interesting about Alien. Now how can I make it into a game? The understanding of game as a medium. This is games as art, as expression of concepts, of the, rather than the machination of rules to no purpose other than themselves. Lord of the Mad Knight is not a capital G great game because of its mechanics work, which they do. It's because it dissects the experience it wishes to create and the sensations you need to create for that. It works on how best to actually create those sensations. Mechanics are pointless by themselves. Mechanics are devices to creating meaning, emotion, experience and love. As I said, an adaptation of the ring isn't really that important. Uh, you know, on other things. On the other hand, and compared to like the best the last decade have turned up with, it's probably lacking the level of depth you'd be expecting. On the other hand, this was three decades ago. Or is it four now? A long time ago. And this is the root of that sort of thinking, and much more present in here than, for example, slightly later. Here's one to think. Uh, games from Britain in the 80s seem much more contemporary than games from Britain in the 90s, or even the early noughties. There, there's, a, there's, a certain famil there's a certain unfamiliarity to them, and the approach to what genre means. Um, probably the best way is sort of swinging back to the, kind of the elite to GTA <coughs> story. Um, people talk about Elite as this great game and all these wonderful things about it. Uh, and, you know, how important it is and all that kind of thing, and how they, the, the size and the freedom, what kind of crap. But they kind of forget what actually really is the core most important thing about Elite. In Elite, you make lots of money by selling shitloads of drugs. <laughs> That's about as British development as it gets. <laughs> That's a tr that sense of transgression that drove, frankly, a lot of the more interesting games. Sensible software ran off it. Uh, and there's more in the bullfrog than I think people don't actually realise. Uh, Japanese development of the sorry Japanese development of the period was at its core corporate. American development at its core at the time was rich. <laughs> British development was at its core was the closing scene of If when Malcolm McDowell machine guns his entire school. Uh, and as much as we think some of that is played out now, that is, a, that is certain, Britain is certainly where it comes from. Basically, this is why GTA 3 is actually the end of that road. is isn't the, isn't the strict Magnus side free form, you know, tech, tech development story. It's also the cultural story, the idea that games um, should, you know, should be about stuff and should be about the culture you find yourself. And the fact that what made GTA 3 kind of the apex and the end point of that particular story is that the, the, it had the two hearts of the parts of the atrium beating together so intensely. Uh, and it kind of, you know, and it was messy and human. And it argued that perfection was kind of what you got if you were aiming too small. Uh, you know, and you're being a bit too easy on yourself, and if you didn't actually have anything to say about the and if you didn't actually have anything to say about the world outside your window or the world inside your head, you probably shouldn't bother. You know, and ideally it should be funny. <laughs> Edge gave it six out of ten. <laughs> that was a typo though. They actually meant to give it eight out of ten. <laughs> Fuck Edge. <laughs> Edge was renamed to Rockstar North, uh, which is a pretty funny joke. Of course, it means you know Scotland is north. <laughs> Scotland's in the north, that's the joke. Uh, it's, also quite, it's also an enormous statement of sadness, which I've been saying for the last 15 years, that, um, uh, that you know, most people will hear the name Rockstar North and think North America. This is the complete annihilation of a history of games. Uh, and that's an emblemic, there's a word I can't say, of the utter loss I'm still talking about. History is written by the winners, uh, this one is for the losers, and uh, spoke to you by a whiner. Thank you.